Hello, this is Hiroki Sayama. In this short presentation, I would like to present some technical details and results of the fall 2019 whole campus traffic simulation. This work has been done by myself, Hiroki, and Shun Cao, a PhD student in system science program. We are also affiliated with the Center for Collective Dynamics of Complex Systems, or COCO, at Binghamton University. This model is technically called the agent-based model on multi-layer transportation networks. Agent-based models are a fairly common simulation framework that is used in complex system science. In agent-based model, we create each individual as an agent, which includes humans and other factors such as buses and the vehicles. We simulate their behaviors one by one very explicitly. In this model, we also use a multi-layer network framework in which multiple modes of transportation are represented as separate networks and then they are integrated together. Specifically for this particular simulation, we represent road network for vehicle transportation and pedestrian pathways for individual pedestrians walking on campus. In the multi-layer transportation networks, we designated specific locations such as dormitories, classrooms, food places, parking lots, bus stops, and campus entrances, so that each individual agent's behavior is specifically moving between those key locations. In total, this simulation model simulates more than 17,000 pedestrians and 10,000 vehicles altogether. The specific objective of this project is to visualize on-campus traffic patterns on a typical Tuesday in the fall semester and use that result to measure the frequencies and locations of close contact that could take place on our campus. This is the multi-layer network model. Here you see roadways surrounding the campus. These roads are for vehicles. And you also see thinner lines. These are for pedestrians. Some of the interesting locations are also marked with these dots. Blue dots are parking lot, green dots are dormitory, pink dots are classrooms or other indoor environments, and red dots are places where people can get food. There are many other data incorporated in this model. The data set circled in this blue line are used to develop the individual agent behaviors. The data we use include the specific course schedules and their classroom locations in the fall 2019, individual students' residence hall and class registration for fall 2019. By combining these two pieces together, every single student who took classes on campus on a typical Tuesday in fall 2019 are explicitly simulated one by one. We also incorporated individual employees including faculty and staff members, their office building locations, and their FTEs. Also, we included bus arrival departure frequencies on parking lot capacities to represent as accurately as possible what would be the behavior of all the human beings on campus on a typical Tuesday in the fall semester. We also have additional information about the square foot areas of the classroom. This has been used to calculate the number of potential close contact that took place inside each building. This was not included in the behavioral modeling of each individual agent, but it was used to obtain the outcome measurement from the simulation result. So here's one example. Here you are looking at a map uh, in which you can see green dots that are individual students, and you can also see a smaller number of black dots also moving in the simulation. They are faculty and staff members. Let me run the simulation. Now you are looking at the simulation starting from 7 a.m., on Tuesday, as you see, when the traffic is very dense, you start to see some heat map background image with the red and the orange type of color. They indicate the areas where the significantly large number of close contact are detected in the simulation. And these green circles that can grow and shrink in the simulation, they represent the indoor spaces and the size of each green disk represent the total number of individuals inside each building. And eventually, the, all the people are gone. And then this is the end of the one day on campus. Let me repeat one more time. Simulation starts at 6.30. And then people start to come into the campus. Uh, they start to occupy their classrooms and other indoor spaces. And between the class uh, meeting times, there will be a lot of the high traffic patterns. And you start to see that there is significant traffic between the lecture hall, science one, Shenang room area, and the marketplace. This is a very busy corridor. 
outside the campus, you also see those blue circles. They represent the number of vehicles that are occupying in each parking lot. Once you get this kind of simulation model, we can calculate many different types of the measurements to validate the model and then obtain some important information that can be useful for planning the reopening process for this coming fall. Here are some more details of hypothetical agent behaviors. We don't have explicit information about how exactly each individual student behaves in reality. So we have to make up a lot of assumptions to fill in the gap. We assume that students are following the actual class schedule over Tuesday. On campus resident, we assume that they are not taking any shuttles or buses, but all the transportation from dormitory to classroom is on foot. And if the particular location is highly congested, their speed of walking can slow down up to the 50% of the normal speed. Off-campus residents, including students living off-campus and faculty and staff members, they tend to commute by car with certain probabilities, and they need to first park a vehicle to the open available parking lot, and then from there, they switch their transportation to walking. The students typically keep moving from class to class according to the schedule. They may also go back to dormitory if there is plenty of time between classes. All the students and some of the faculty and staff members try to make a quick trip for the nearest food source at the appropriate time, if possible. If there is no time for them, they can simply skip such a lunch break. And once all the schedule is completed, the individual is going to go back home, either to the dormitory or the outside campus. In order to make sure that the model is reasonably accurate, we need to do validation process. In this particular project, we use the parking opening data that is actually measured in uh, fall 2019. The heat map you see here is the actual data of the number of available parking spaces from morning until the evening. And the darker colors mean the more spaces available. And the horizontal axis is the different parking IDs. The panel on the bottom is the measurement obtained from the simulated result coming from our computational model. Even though the details might be different, the general pattern has a pretty good agreement with the actual observation. So this gives us some confidence that the model is doing a reasonable job in capturing the behavior of the on-campus population. And the plot on the right is showing the same information in the scatter plot. The horizontal axis is the number of openings in actual data. The vertical axis is the number of openings in the simulated result in the log-log scale. And this curve is actually the linear trend line. The correlation is reasonably high. The R square value is 0.76. This is quite indirect, but a reasonable validation of this model. Now that we have the computational model working, we can count how many close contacts that took place on campus. In the outdoor scenario, we can simply measure the distance between two individual agents. If they become less than six feet, and if that persisted more than 10 minutes, then we count that as one incident of close contact. For the indoor environment, we didn't simulate a detailed movement of students. So we have to use some theoretical estimate of the number of close contacts that took place. You can estimate the number of close contact by using the total number of people occupying the space, the total area of the space, and the area of the three-foot radius desk around each individual. By using this formula, this gives you the actual number of close contact that must be taking place under these constraints. So we applied this formula to every single indoor environment location in the simulation. By combining them together, we can visualize how much close contact took place for the entire day. And this is a cumulative heat map. As you see, there is a huge amount of close contact taking place between the lecture hall and the marketplace. And also the, from lecture hall to the Union bus station, there is a lot of traffic between those two areas. By looking at this kind of map, we can learn which part of the campus would need a specific action to be taken to control the student's behavior to avoid any close contact. We can also run the hypothetical scenario simulation by reducing population density. This is the example in which we reduced the total population to 50%. And this cumulative heat map, you still see the, some corridor between Science 1 and the marketplace, but this is much better than the original one. And if you further reduce the population density to 25%, the close contact is basically gone. So the question is, how much population density reduction is needed and most appropriate to achieve our goal? We can conduct a systematic simulation by reducing the population density from the original 100% all the way down to the 10%. And here is the plot showing how much reduction of the number of close contacts were achieved by how much reduction of population density. This diagonal line represents a reference case in which 1% population density decrease results in 1% decrease in the number of close contacts. 
as you can see in this plot, the initial part is going down to much steeper than the reference line. This means that up to this point, the 1% reduction of population density gives us more benefit than the 1% reduction of close contact. Beyond this point, the efficiency of population density reduction is not giving us much of the benefit. So maybe the rational decision-making point will be somewhere around 45%. That's one way to interpret this result. Another way to interpret this result is to consider the epidemiological threshold. R0, or the basic reproductive number, is a key quantity in understanding the disease spreading. This is an average number of new infections one active infectant is going to produce. In this model, we can represent the R0 value as a product of the number of days in which each student is actively shedding and spreading the virus times the number of close contact that person produces per day times the rate of infection per close contact incident. The literature says that D is typically just two or three days. And here we try to be conservative. So we assume that D equals four. And also the infection rate per close contact incident is also known to be around 3% or less. But here again, we want to be a little bit more conservative. So we assume the 5% infection rate. By putting these two numbers together here and then let R0 to be the critical value one, we get number of close contact per day should be less than five. So this line shows the critical threshold below which disease should not spread. This consideration also gives us the good estimate that probably the optimal density would be around 45% to 50%. So this is another way to interpret these simulation results. To summarize, this project has produced several findings. The first, we were able to identify the high traffic, high density contact areas on our campus. Particularly for those specific areas on campus, we need to put more resources to create a more regulated laned approach and behavior control measures. We also conducted a systematic simulation to study the effect of lowering population density, and we learned that their effect is nonlinear. By exploiting the nonlinearity, we may be able to find out the sweet spot of the campus population density that is the most efficient from the cost-benefit analysis and also be able to suppress the spread of diseases. As a final remark, we'd like to emphasize that this model is a highly stylized model with lots of details ignored. But we still believe that the main result we obtained from this simulation model is fairly robust and useful for our decision-making process. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us.